All right, everybody, we are live. Hello, I'm Erica Gutsgibbon, your gentle and modern host, and I'm here with Steve Mitchell. I've been really excited for this particular interview and this, this presentation. Steve is a retired petroleum geologist, and uh, Steve, would you like to maybe give us a little bit of your background, where you're coming from, credentials, thoughts on kind of what we're about to talk about? Sure, I mean, we'll be glad to. Uh, as, I, as she says, I, I am a retired geologist there, and uh, it's good to meet her and be able to talk about this. I like to talk about these type of topics a lot. Um, I worked for Mobile Oil Company and Exxon Mobil. Then after Mobil was bought by Exxon and stuff for a total of like 37 years, so that's a, a long period of time. We were, I worked in a lot of different places, so I, I have a bachelor's degree in geology from Eastern New Mexico University, and then a master's in from uh, the University of Texas at El Paso. Um, I retired about five years ago, but I worked in a lot of places. I worked in at a lot of different scales of type of thing, from exploration to uh, production geology, detail field, field descriptions, and this type of thing. I started out working in kind of West Texas, and that's going to tie into what we talk. We'll talk about a little bit more later on that because there's some great geology there that really hits into the topics that we're talking about for this. So I worked there, then I and doing different things, and then I worked out in offshore Texas. So that was working in a whole different type of geology and stuff with a lot of seismic in, involved in that. And um, then I ended up transferring to. Um, New Orleans, or they transferred me there and continued working that. And then I spent four years in London, four years working on frontier exploration, working north of uh, north of London in areas where there were no fields at the time, but now there are some fields developed there. I came back, worked a little more in South Texas, and then worked on uh, Nigeria. I worked in Nigeria and uh, basically Angola for over. 15 years and that was and that's some of my favorite type of geology because part of the seismic is so good that you can see a lot of things see a lot of details that you just can't see in other places and, and it just has a lot of cool stuff going on there and then i was transferred for three years to norway and i'm drawing some interesting field in an interesting field there with some really cool geology but a lot of it just playing around in norway was kind of fun too because it's, a, it's a beautiful area that is it's kind of like one guy said, it's kind of like living in a national park, you know, it's just oh a, big nation, it's a big national park and it's just gorgeous there. So that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, in terms of what I, my specialties, if you would say that way, was probably dealing with the field of the stratigraphy, which talks about how lock, the rocks are laid down and, you know, what the order is and how the, how they work together in that way, and just regional geology and then production geology. So these type of thing, type of areas. Well, uh, you're, you've globe trotted around the whole earth, essentially. You've gotten to, to do geology in such a wide variety of places. And I think that that, um, that that probably gives you a really nice perspective on just how different different parts of the world are with regard to their geology, but also kind of the concepts that unify them together. Yeah, there's a lot of things that, that really tie together that way. That's a, that's an important part of, of what you see. You know, it's like some of the things which we'll talk about young earth creationism and some mm. of the ideas that they have. And they, the people who work this thing just really oftentimes don't have a picture of what it really looks like when you come off of the uh, off of a continent and stuff. And, you know, I've looked at a lot of a lot of lines across that thousands of seismic lines around the world that way. And it's you know, it just tells a, a very complex story, but it's a long story too. So, so that's kind of good. Hey, but that's, well, we got all the time in the world. I'm excited. So Steve, would you like to go ahead and share your screen and we'll get this kind of presentation going. And as I mentioned before, I'll be stopping you here and there to ask questions and, and pry. <laughs> okay, sharing screen. Initiate screen share. Any moment now, it's gonna happen. Okay, there yeah. it is. All and right, we're up, huh? Oh, very good. Oh, smooth. I like it. Okay, well, I'm gonna get to a picture off some pictures out of this. You know, in the, in the kind of corporate world, the world of PowerPoint is there, so I have a PowerPoint presentation. 
beautiful. Oh, it's got effects. I love it. <laughs> so you see that uh, the title on this is, is kind of a Texas size challenge to young earth creation. And that's kind of a title I use for a book. Um, I grew up in Eastern New Mexico originally. So this was, this is kind of the home country as far as that goes, but also where I worked with, worked with for a long time. So you know, that the mountain here is, uh, is El Capitan or Capitan Peak in West Texas. So that's, part of the story there. Uh, let me see. I do want to point out that, uh, you know, I'm a geologist, but I'm also a Christian. And I became a Christian when I was very young. I studied it. I had a passion for Christian things and a passion for science both. And they, I didn't see why those should be a conflict or a problem to those. And um, there's a long history of this type of thing. These are a couple of the uh, top scientists or top geologists from the kind of the late 1800s, James Dana and John Dawson. And they're both Christians and they're both, uh, you know, what we would call old earth Christians now. And so they didn't see any conflict between their faith and the science. But unfortunately, there's a, there is a group that's kind of come up later than this that we would call the young earth creationists and they have a conflict they see problems with things that i think really aren't don't exist but uh that's kind of what it where we're going to talk about that way when i started in college uh i started studying geology and my uh sunday school teacher gave me a copy of a book that was put out by uh, written by john whitcomb and henry morris called the genesis flood oh yes <laughs> And if you're familiar with that, that kind of started the Young Earth Movement. And so he gave me this. This hadn't been out very long when I was back when I was in college a long time ago. And so I read that and I tried to say, well, you know, first it sounded really good. I'm, I'm expecting to understand now how I can put together the, the uh, geology and, and the Bible. And I found out it just didn't work. You know, the things that I was seeing just didn't make any sense. So I kind of put that on the back shelf for, for a while and begin to continue to learn about both uh, both faith and the uh, science. And that really postponed until about 2012. And then I, when I transferred to Norway, I had a little more time to work with it and I began to kind of study. So for the last 10 years, I've kind of been studying this stuff in more detail, trying to put together a more consistent picture of what I see. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. First of all, we're going to, to see what type of predictions come from uh, young earth creation and how, the, the, how they impact geology. And then we can take a look at then some of the predictions in the, the particular study area where I will work at, be talking about basically the Texas and kind of surrounding areas there. And look at what are supposed to be flood deposits and what are supposed to be flood deposits and kind of compare those and see how, how things stand up. Okay, so here's here's a set of kind of young earth creation assumptions that kind of hit geology. Typically, they believe that the earth was created mature and complete. So at some point, it just sort of appears and it's already mature and complete. Some people would say that it's, it kind of had a fast forward type of uh, type of uh, development. But basically, creation took place over what were six 24 hour days. And uh, that's pretty different than what the geologist is saying. Right, right. A bit of a problem there. A couple now, little differences here and there. <laughs> the date of creation, when it took place, is, is either indicated or limited by the kind of the genealogies that are given in the Old Testament. So it's, some would say it's 6,000 years. Some would say, well, there could be gaps, so maybe it's 10,000 years old. But of course, to the geologists, those are kind of saying the same thing. They would say the life appears on day three of this creation. So you can't say because if you've got fossils in it, it can't be something that was created to look that way. In other words, the fossils really are from things which really lived. In fact, they would say that there wasn't any death prior to when Adam rejected God and he, and he sinned. So that would be a, a uh, what's called the fall. So anytime you so any fossils had to be after that point too. It's interesting that they all, Many times, many of them will say that um, animal life was created vegetarian and it began to eat meat as a result of the, result of the fall. 
all. So again, if you've got any carnivores in your in the fossils, you know those had to take light, had to form light. And some many of them believe that there's no rain before the flood, but they and many of them would say is the Noah's flood was this global event that took place. So these are things we can we can look at these type of things in the rock record and see what they look like and see if this is what we're expecting to see. They do make a nice set of predictions, don't they? Um, I've, I, I'm sure you've heard this, Steve, but one thing that I've asked young earth creationists a few times is, is what do we make of, you know, these sort of micro fossils, micro fossils, excuse me, that show up in things like basement granite that's supposed to be this pre-flood rock that was sort of created ex, ex nihilo. Um, and if there's no death before the fall, why do we have, you know, this, this sort of fossil bacteria in there? And I have repeatedly been told that bacteria, they just don't count. That doesn't count as as a true fossil, uh, nor does it count as a true living thing, which I, I was quite tickled by. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> if that's you say so. That's pretty convenient, isn't it? That's, that's a convenient type of type of thing. And, stuff. And, I, and again, some would say that, okay, well, you know, maybe that some things, for instance, uh, we can give examples of stromatolites. Stromatolites are basically these algal mats that trap sediment in them, right? Right. And so they will say that some of these piles of these mats could have been created in place. So in other words, the events that it's showing really never happened. They just were just appeared that way. And that's a, that's an interesting take on things. But they would again say they're saying that life really doesn't count until it's more complex than that. Yeah. So, yeah. And it, it feels, you know, um, as, as I mentioned to you before, you know, I, I kind of felt that that feels a bit deceptive uh, to make things sort of look as if they're old when in reality uh, they, they very much aren't. I've, I've, I've never really been on board with that uh, as an idea, um, nor you know, am I super keen on the idea that what is alive and what is not alive just kind of, it's whatever is convenient. I like that word that you used for it, calling it convenient, because boy, boy howdy is it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a bit of an ad hoc type of type of thing that way. And again, when many of us would say that, again, this makes it makes God to be doing things, creating things to appear in ways that they didn't. It's kind of a deception type of thing. And mm. we see the same thing out in those who would not we say that some have said that well, maybe starlight came was created as as coming this way. But then that means that the events that we see taking place farther than six thousand years ago really never happened. And that's kind of a that's kind of a problem for most of us to believe that God would be deceptive like that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to break these down a little bit more into you know some more simple type of things. So basically, they're saying is that all of the rocks were deposited since that were deposited since creation were deposited just a few thousand years. Okay, we can look at that. We can measure them and see if that holds up. They would say the large amounts of the rock record were deposited or formed by a global flood that was laid down, laid down its deposits over a one year period. Okay. One year kind of limits a lot of things that way. When you look after the flood, then everything that is supposed to be post flood had to be also taking place in a really short time. And we'll show that it's, it's even shorter than probably what most of them think it is. Boy, I'll say. <laughs> and then it said, okay. And then the other problem is that they would say that the rocks can actually be interpreted to fit these claims. In other words, they just don't are magically appearing, but there's actually a consistent way of interpreting them. It might not be the only way to interpret them, but there is a way to interpret them that way. And we'll take a look at that claim. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, first of all, You've got to understand how geologists decide what order things took place in. I call it the stratigraphic filing system, or you can call it the law of superposition. You could say basically what it says is that we can figure out what order events took place in. You could compare it to this. You could compare it to a college dorm room or something like that. And you'd say, okay, where would I look in this office to figure out where the oldest papers are? And at the bottom. Say, at the bottom of some pile there. <laughs> they're going to be the oldest papers and if i probably worked hard enough i could put them in a sort of an order that wouldn't be far from what you know what it is right yes and same thing with rocks the bottom rocks are the oldest rocks and the uh, younger rocks and stuff are on top of them and stuff it's not a not a very high-tech science type of a type of answer but it works pretty well pretty intuitive i like it so if we looked at that 
and we looked at the uh, rocks that are in around our Earth. You know, from a young Earth creation standpoint, they would be forming in a series of phases, basically, or series of when you put those rocks together, you could put together what's basically a geologic column. So from their standpoint, you could say that, well, there were rocks that were created to look mature. That would be this phase one. And then you had another period, which is about 1,656 years, which would be the pre-flood deposits. Those deposited before Noah lived. Some would say there's not much rock represented in that, in that, maybe none. But regardless, there is a time period. And then there's that one year period or maybe two years if you say that, well, it took a little while after the flood to stabilize everything. But that's the flood deposit. And then after that, you get into the post-flood deposits. And I would suggest that you could deposit, break those down into those that were, uh, where they disagree on with us on the age of those, and those are when everyone kind of agrees with the age. Sure. And you could say, well, maybe that took place at, uh, after the birth of those, after the birth of Christ, or maybe the Spanish conquistadors, if you're looking at Texas. Sure, right. But most people would say that, you know, once we get to the time of Abraham, kind of everyone should agree with that, right? So that's kind of the young earth rock. So in other words, if you took rocks from that were developed in each of these periods, they would always be kind of in this order. And this is kind of the order that they would have formed in anyway. And geologists, yeah. have, geologists have an order, right? That's on the right side there. And these are different periods or different eras. Those were the uh, Precambrian or those that had very only very simple fossils. And then you had those which had more complex but older fossils called the Paleozoic. And then they kind of the age of the dinosaurs called the Mesozoic or Mesozoic, if you happen to be from England. And uh, the Cenozoic up above that. And then each of those are broken up into, into periods and epochs. So young earth creationists who have done much in the way of studying in geology tend to recognize that this is, uh, this is true. In other words, they may dis they'll disagree with how long things happened and how long it took to do this, but they recognize that this order is empirically true. These are just something, observations. Something that you just said kind of resonated with me. It's not something that I've really considered more, I consider very often, I guess, or, or vocalized on this channel. But the, the idea that like once humans start recording things, everything almost has to be more or less in its present position, at least in Mesopotamia by that time, right? Otherwise, we would be recording, you know, at least some catastrophic level events occurring in the Cenozoic that people may have noticed and written down. <laughs> yeah, I mean... And you, and you think about when that when that is. I mean, there's a lot of things which took place a long time be took place before that. Anyway, from a geologist standpoint, we would expect it to be a long time. But right, things Abraham, like, like he's going to be basically in the late Holocene. So in other words, right. all the stuff that took place it was before the time of Abraham, regardless of how long that period was. Right, and and that's going to kind of that's got to be at least a cutoff point because post you know humans start recording history things like abraham and and you know the egyptians and other cultures that are writing things down i'm sure they would have noticed certain rapid glacial pulses going on you know that that would normally have taken at least a hundred thousand years to actually occur that now has to be crammed into quite a small time period you know to, to be an observable human history that's right now if you now if you're in um places like you're doing archaeology or something like that, then you need to be very precise about where that is, where those points yeah. are. But for what we're looking at, it doesn't need to be very precise at all because the differences between what the age that the young earth creation model has and the rate that things have to take place compared to what we think from a uh, more standard geological understanding is so different that you don't have to be very precise about that. It's, uh, it's going to show up regardless. So let me just show you, in other words, if I can try to correlate those two, what would I say? Again, I, like I said, the uh, idea that the, um, if you could see my arrow and stuff on that, from kind of the time of Abraham around 2000 BC, kind of ties into the late Holocene and stuff. So we kind of agree on things at that point and stuff. And down below that, 
you know, where's the base of the flood? Well, some people would say it, they've said it could be in the Arche base of the Archean or the Proterozoic, but uh, a lot of times the base of the flood is taken as to be the base of the Cambrian. So what does that mean when we look at that? I'm going to show another, another way of looking at this. Again, you know, this has got those same colors, color bands as, but it has different young earth creationist arguments on for this and where they interpret things to be at. Now, the blue interval in here is supposed to be the flood. Now, if you, uh, you would think that this is the biggest event in all in world history, right? Right, you would, right. You would think you'd be pretty easy to recognize the base of it and the top of it. I mean, this is one very cataclysmic cataclysmic type of event, so it ought to be very clear. But apparently it's not so easy to recognize that. As you can see, there's a lot of different ideas about that. Mm. And there's two most popular type of uh, organizations right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Are the Answers in Genesis. <coughs> That's Andrew Snelling. If you... Uh, these are kind of main geologists and stuff. Oh, I'm, with blood, with the, yes, I, I, know, I think we've heard of Andrew Snelling once or twice around here. <laughs> and, and you might be, a, I think you might be a little bit familiar with their, uh, their arc as well. Oh, yes. Yes, I've, I've I, maybe, you know, maybe I've been there like once. Um, <laughs> made a little video about it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But and there's also another organization called ICR, the Institute for Creation Research and stuff, and uh, they have a different model on that. And and this is T Dr. Tim Clary. Again, these are both, both men have uh, PhDs in geology, so they you would think they should be knowledgeable about things. And so you can take seriously some of their observations and stuff, regardless that way. But apparently they have a very sharp disagreement in terms of where the, particularly the top of the flood is. Yep, I've I've heard of this. Yeah, the, the, the flood boundary is an it's an interesting question because some of them place it at approximately the Mesozoic and the end of the Mesozoic with the, the KPG boundary, and others will place it somewhere in the Cenozoic, depending on who you talk to. And you know, boy, as you mentioned earlier, you sure would think that a that the biggest worldwide event that has ever impacted planet Earth would be a little bit more clear with where it started and where it ended. <laughs> You would think so. You would think so. Now, then this time, for this chart, now you, you see that I put all of these kind of periods and epochs as all kind of having the same thickness. But of course, geologists based on radiometric dating are going to put them at, at different lengths on that. Part of the point that I try to make is that, you know, I think radiometric dating is, is valid. I think it's, but I think it's an independent measure of the, of the validity as far as deep time or the age of the Earth goes. In other words, we, you don't have to have radiometric dating to already realize that there's a problem with uh, trying to put things in this mo in this mode. I want to yeah. show you if, but if I put that in the, I'm going to compare just the answers in Genesis and the ICR modes with uh, in with a more of a conventional type of dating on this, and we'll take a look at that here. Oh my and goodness. So here again, they, you've got the uh, flood deposits. These are supposed to be one-year deposits by the different people. And uh, again, the ICR would say that the uh, flood started at the base of the Cambrian period, and then they're going to raise up to the peak of the peak of the flood is going to be the top of the Cretaceous. And then most of the tertiary section, or most of the uh, Cenozoic period, is going to be this receding phase of the flood, basically up to the top of the Pliocene. Okay, that's that's one view. Now on the other side, Dr. Snelling would say that okay, we had the flood starts in the same place, but it's going to rise up to a, basically the top of the Permian or the top of the Paleozoic period. And then it's all receding through the time of the dinosaurs or the Mesozoic period. And then after that, you have post-flood deposits. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of these in more detail in terms of where they, where they go from there. Okay. 
So again, here's the two issues we're going to talk about based on, on what we see in these areas. One problem that they have is there's basically just too many events taking place, too little time to fit them into. Oh, yeah. And I, I borrow this line from a, from another geologist, uh, Christian, and he calls himself a geo-Christian online. But he uses this phrase, just too many events and too little time. That sums it up quite nicely, I think. <laughs> but you also have some what are kind of like the, the square peg in the round hole. You have things that are just incompatible. Right. You know, where you've got, for instance, for in a flood, you shouldn't have all these massive thick desert deposits. You know, that, that just doesn't doesn't compute. So here's where, so to dive into those, we're going to look at, this is the area where I've I'm going to consider my kind of study area or focus area. And we're going to talk about Texas, but since I'm from New Mexico, we're going to stretch it into New Mexico a little bit. I did a master's thesis down in Mexico at this little, a little uh, mountain range called Sierra Gomez. And so that I stretched some, use it for some things. And then I worked offshore Texas. So we're going to stretch it all the way to offshore Texas, to kind of the end of where the salt goes to a place called the Sixby Esc Escarpment out there. And so these are kind of, this is a geologic map. Each of the, it's color coded kind of by the ages that you have on the uh, stratigraphic column. At least that works on, on the onshore. And then offshore is a little bit different because the, at the surface of the, of the, um, or the bottom of the water, it's all kind of the same age. So now you're looking at different types of structural regimes there. This area is kind of fun because it's got a lot of control in it. I mean, we understand the surface geology really well. It is out in the public domain, so we can work with that. It's a little harder for that, like in Nigeria or places there. And it's also got a lot of well control. Mm. There are probably roughly a, a million wells in this area. So A million? Literally a million wells. Wow. I have so no cool. idea that... that wells were that prolific even i mean i guess texas is pretty large but a million that's that's a lot of wells <laughs> it is a lot of wells it's a lot of well control to, to do something, this. Something, course, that I, something that i discussed with dr hinky when when he'd been on here as well is is very much in line with what you're saying here which is that the geology of west texas is so well characterized in part because of the oil exploration that's gone on there that's right I mean, you've got the well control there that you would never have in so many parts of the world and stuff because, right. of, because of the oil. We understand the order of these, these rocks. Again, that stratigraphic tiling system is well constrained on this. And right. we, we use a lot of biostratigraphic control and fossils to, to date things, but you really wouldn't need it in any of this area because you could tie it with enough well control and seismic lines that you wouldn't need that type of control. It's just, it's very well documented in that. You can get around faults and around things in order to really document just by that law of superposition, what order things took place in. Right. So that that's one of the helps on that. So, okay, we're gonna take a look at this area and we're going to zoom into West Texas in here. And we're gonna take a look at Something that doesn't show up on the sub on the surface at all, but down in the subsurface, I'll draw a cross section across that. And this is a cross section that's drawn in that. And it's really been kind of flattened on what it would have looked like at the end of the Permian period. Right. In there. So this is, this is kind of the picture of it. Each of the colors on here, there's different types of lithologies. So you've got dolomites. You in kind of the purple. You've got. Uh, Light blue is uh, limestones, the yellows are sandstones, the green areas in here are uh, oil fields, and as you say, oil fields have uh, made for a lot of studying. Mm. When, I, when I got out for my bachelor's degree, I went to work for Gulf Oil for a little while as a roustabout in the summer to try to make a little bit of money, and I worked on this, there's a field over here kind of on the... Uh, left-hand side over here, that's the uh, North Ward Estes, a big green area in there. And believe me, there are a lot of wells in that field, except it's a major field. And that's true for a lot of this. So it's really well understood what's happening here. Right. 
So now let's take a look at that. Some of the things we can learn about that. So we're going to back it up. What we're going to do is we're going to look at what it would have looked like before the Permian period. And what you see is it's, uh, see, I've taken off the top part of that. Right. And you see the limestones. And there's a whole story, of course, how all of these rocks were deposited. But the point to make for, that I'm making here is the fact that these were laid down flat. They were buried deeply, so they were actually hardened into real rock. And then they were exposed, but they were folded up like you see this into basically what was an ancient mountain range. And so that there were mountains there that are over, were over a mile high, but those were eroded away. And in fact, we know that these were hard rocks at the time because I had one of the professors that talked about how you could go ahead. He found oil and gas fields because he could go in and look at this and find the uh, gravels that were ancient streams that deposit that were made up of those older rocks. So these were stream gravels and you could use the stream paths on those to find where the reservoirs went. Trace them downstream, right. That's wild. So you're chasing that. So again, these had to be hard rocks because these were, uh, these were folded after that point. They were already right. hard rocks before they were folded. And that, that kind of flies against some of the things that uh, young earth creationists are saying. That they're saying that these were folded because they were soft sediment. No, that's not the way it worked. Anyway, so we've eroded away these rocks. And now after that, and this is oh, this is the picture of kind of what happens in what happened in its area similar to that, down south of that, in, in an area called Marathon Basin. The Marathon is a tiny little town in West Texas. But you can see me there, and I've got some uh, vertical beds on that. And then if you look in the background, you see horizontal beds. And kind of between those, you have an unconformity. So what we're having is some uh, Paleozoic rocks, and then those have been uh, eroded. They've been folded and then eroded away, and then flat beds on top of that, and this time in the Cretaceous period. So now then... After that, uh, after the deposition or after the erosion of those mountains away, then the thing set, sinks again and we get the deposition of a lot of carbonates. And we see this band of light blue that's over on the, on the left side. Right. Those were ancient reefs. Okay. Again, those were, they're actually ancient reefs that made up a lot of, uh, they were became porous and were filled up with water, fresh water. So that's where a lot of, where a lot of fresh water comes from out is, in West Texas as well. Is this area that we're looking at right now, this basin, is this the same basin the Castile Formation is located in? Castile Formation comes in off of this on the on the left side over there, and it kind of onlaps across that, yeah. Okay, because I know the Castile Formation is in part created by some of these old ancient reef systems. A Castile formation forms these has these neat bands in them and stuff. There are these dark and white bands. They're they're made up of anhydrite, originally anhydrite yeah. and uh, and calcite. Yeah. We think of them as probably being annual varves. So yep. annual de deposition on that. They um, the guys actually counted those, and you had like two hundred thousand of those over that were counted at one time on that. There were distinct mm -hmm. bands and stuff. So you can kind of quantify that the Castile, in geologic terms, was deposited very, very quickly. Oh. In terms of, of course, the demands of maybe a young Earth creation model, that's a long time. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but not so here. I'm going to talk about that reef a little bit more, though, because I, I like the... I think reefs are really an interesting feature to try to... Uh, try to put together with some of these things. So this is, these are some of the penetrations of that reef. Just, it's actually just the very top reef of the last reef that formed in here. That's just called the Capitan Reef. And there are these, uh, on the map that you see on here, there's all these red dots. These are wells that have penetrated that particular reef. Comes near Carlsbad, New Mexico. You can walk out on the reef in Carlsbad or you can go down through it in Carlsbad Caverns there. You can also find it in exposures, again, in the Guadalupe Mountains, 
the Apache Mountains, Glass Mountains. So there's a lot of places to do this. So it's so this was a, an ancient reef. This is kind of what it might have looked like would at that time. Something like that. In other yeah. words, this this was quite a quite a formation that that took place there. Um, you know, the geologists use a lot of different uh, definitions for what's a reef, and sometimes it gets a little confusing that way. But from my standpoint, I use the term for the type of discussions that we're having here is to say that we have here a, you know, a concentrated organic accumulation of carbonate. It's in the shape of a mound or a buildup in that way. It's all locally derived and some of it is growing in place. If you were to dig through a modern reef, you'd find a lot of the stuff has been broken up by storms and chewed up by later critters and this type of thing. But some of them are still going to be growing in place. And that's what we are here. And this, there's going to be facies that are kind of consistent with modern reef facies. Now, in this case, it's not coral like a modern reef is, though. There's like 35 different feces, different species of sponges and bryzoans and algae and crinoids and all kinds of things which form this reef that way. But, you know, the, to me, this is kind of, you've got lots of events, very little time. And actually, when a reef grows, it doesn't grow in, in turbid, muddy water like you might have in a flood. So, again, that's kind of a, you know, square peg in a round hole problem. Steve, if I may ask, are, so these are, this is the Permian, right? So they've got to be like rugose corals, you know, growing, not the modern kind of corals that we have, or like sponges, like you kind of mentioned. But I, I actually did a, a video quite some time ago specifically about, you know, coral reefs and how they, you know, how they function sort of within the young earth creationist lens, given how they grow, and a different one on limestone and how limestone is problematic due to its slow deposition rate. And this seems, if, if I'm kind of understanding this correctly, this is this is a large ancient reef that has to be accounted for as growing and changing during the middle of a worldwide flood. And this coral reef that requires calm, clear waters to thrive is doing that. I mean, the only problem is this is this isn't coral for that most part. Now there were coral that there were coral that grew in the Permian time, but that's not what was happening in this. Part. Okay, so these, like you said, so okay, so more rhizozoans uh, and peripherans and things like that. Yeah, a lot of algae things which form this type of thing, and you know, there, I've had uh, articles. There was a key article by one of the uh, young Earth creationists says, "Oh, this was this was all transported into place," but no, it didn't happen that way. Yeah. I, I imagine it would be a bit too fragile to have been transported in place, huh? Yeah, I mean, there's just it's, there's so much of it and stuff. And then you try to figure out, if you look at the map, you try to figure out, well, which way did it come from, right? It had to come from all directions and stuff. Well, that's kind of <laughs> strange. We're going to look at some other reefs, too, though, because I, like I said, I think reefs are a real challenge from, the, for a, uh, from a young Earth creationist model. So if this one happens to be in the Permian time. Oh, this is just a picture of, of what it might have looked like. So uh, you see the uh, what looks like today in the uh, mountain range there. So you have the Capitan Peak that kind of sticks up over on the right. And then back behind that is Guadalupe Peak, the highest point in Texas. Cool. And then immediately you, you go into New Mexico, into the real God's country. And then we, um, but you can kind of see the, the beds that are tilting like this, the uh, diagram shows in that, and then there's sandstone down in the basin, and the little you know, figure in the in the bottom kind of shows what it would have looked like maybe at the time of deposition. There's a lot to explain. It's not just the reef that's a, a problem, actually. There's just there's a, an entire set of features that are, that are recognized there. You get into a lagoon that's in the back. You get into these algal fats algal flats, and then a, a sabco, which is a salt flat environment in the far back that way. And then out in front of it, you get these great deep water sandstones, which formed and stuff. And they formed at low stands of sea level. And those are, are really cool things to study because they, they provide really great analogs for some of the things that we drill in the uh, deep water in other areas today. So this is okay. a, a pic picture of that. 
So if, if I may, to be quite clear for, for people who may be watching who don't have as much of a background with some of this geology stuff. So the way that we're, we're kind of reconstructing these paleo environments with the Alva Flats and the lagoons and things like that is that we typically have analogs today which leave diagnostic characteristics that we can then apply to the past. Would that be a fair characterization? I mean, it certainly is. That's, that's one of the key things that we do is okay. we do we do try to look at those analogs but you know it's it's not like we're saying that we're seeing always the exact same thing just like in this case we're seeing things that were formed by algae and all of these other different creatures but they form the same shapes and things that we see coral forms doing today right, right. and i imagine the composition is probably is probably quite recognizable as well chemically speaking when you start mapping these things in detail, you can you can recognize the same type of distribution of faces, the same type of organisms that would be in the same type of settings as you would see in modern type of settings today. And certainly we one of the things carbonate stratigraphers have is they, they like to be able to go into the modern reefs and go into that, which is a kind of a boondoggle in a way, because hey, we get to go out, they get to go out and study Sweet. And snorkel out in the beach. <laughs> <laughs> out in the reefs, but it's that's really a, that's important. A, that's the assignment. Yeah, you want to get on. <laughs> <laughs> that's a yeah, that's a hard duty, isn't it? Well, yeah. Well, so to to add like kind of one last thing, like this to me sticks out as a massive sore thumb because again, for those out there watching, this is this is in the Permian, so this is something that cannot be chalked up to. It was covered at the beginning of the flood, and it was just like this. It had to have formed in media res in the middle of things and how are you going to get things like algal flats and lagoon signals and reefs and things like that in the middle of a global flood that's going to be quite difficult that's right that's exactly right i think you just it just doesn't fit that way and there's you know i showed you a whole bunch of different models but virtually every one of those models would say that this is taking place somewhere in their flood yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> right. you say, it's not on the lower part of it either. So yeah, it's, you know, it's smack dab in the middle. That's the Permian, baby. That's in the middle. You, they can't can't get away from that. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm I'm on board. I, I see what we're doing here. Okay, now what we're going to do? We just looked at the at the Capitan Reef, but there's a lot of different reef trends to that. These are some of the major trends which took place in, you know, in this particular study area. If you look in other parts of the world, you'd find lots of them. In the bar over here, kind of on the, on the right along that stratigraphic column, these are where some of the reefs are formed, and these are some of them here. But I want to take a look at a few of these others just to kind of drive home the point. We looked at Permian, so that was the Capitan Reef. We're going to look a little bit older than that. We're going to go back to the Cambrian period time. So this is, again, early after the flood. This is a, a little algal stromatolite reef, and there's a whole series of these that form in kind of central Texas. Algal stromatolites, again, were these algal mats that have trapped sediment, and then they, and they build up all of these layers. And we think about those as taking place over time. So they're not something that you would expect to be happening instantaneously that way. I mean, typically... Individual laminations today take, you know, about two to two to six years for each lamination. Oh, I see. How many laminations are here? Did you say? Oh, well, there will be there will be hundreds of laminations in this. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this is going to be a little bit difficult. We're talking thousands of years uh, for the formation in just this specific spot within the Cambrian. And so you see, this is supposed to be in um, either a either the AIG or the ICR type of models, this is supposed to be right after the flood. Yeah, yeah. right. So it's going to be very difficult to form something like this at the very beginning, and it couldn't have been created ancient, right? Because I'm assuming there's there's fossil material within this as well. That's right. That's right. Okay. So you okay. Okay. And in fact, um, like Andrew Snelling has taken some of these similar type of features and said that they had to be pre-flood because they couldn't have formed in the flood in the period immediately before this in the Proterozoic period. So if they can't be formed by a flood, how are these formed by a flood? Well, and, and that's also 
quite strange because I've, I've heard a great many of them suggest that the conditions necessary for fossilization are necessarily within the flood, that only the flood could provide these conditions necessary for fossilization, which of course we know that isn't the case. Fossils form today, albeit they're forming quite slowly, so we can't see it all in one lifetime, but this, this would be very problematic to say it's pre-flood because they need the flood for all the fossils. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And like these these uh, particular stromatolites, you, we, I told you I'd like to go to Australia. There's a bay there called Shark Bay where you can see these algal stromatolites growing in, uh, in these mounds and stuff that are beautiful mounds and stuff there. And it's a great example that's very similar to what we're seeing here. And uh, they typically think those mounds are, those little individual ones are taking like a thousand years to grow. So again, to do this all in a, in a really, it has to be done in a few days because you can't use your whole flood interval, whole year in one of these either. So, right. Because so you've got to use the rest for every other period within the geologic column that you're saying the flood is responsible for. So this has to happen ridiculously rapidly, despite the fact that these laminae, at least today and since we've been observing them, you know, classic observational science takes six years to form. As you mentioned, that's that's a problem. Okay. Yeah. I see. Oh boy. All right. Okay. So this is this is the Cambrian example. Now we're going to go up up a little bit shallower to that to skip up to the uh, a place called the Horseshoe Atoll. This is in uh, the Pennsylvanian period. So we're still it's is kind of between the Cambrian period and below, and the Permian period that we looked at. And there's a really thick accumulation in there that's around 3,000 feet thick, 3,000 feet of uh, great carbonate rocks that uh, was deposited as a type, type of reef. It's very similar to the to the reef forming organisms that we had in Capitan. There's a lot of phylloid algae and this type of thing in it. But what's interesting also is not only did you had to have to deposit this, but at times it's clear that the um, sea level dropped at various periods of time and when it would drop then freshwater leaching would take place and it would wash and it would create holes in the reef that's very nice because it holds a lot of oil that way oh yeah so this because this thing has had like two and a half billion barrels of oil that's come out of it so it's, it's had a lot of that. that's but a you, lot of oil you had 20 layers of that of this porous limestone that have developed on, as separate things that were separated by shale so 20 different times it was exposed to fresh water for a long enough period of time for the fresh water to leach away some of the limestone. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Wait. So, okay. So this is, so this is Pennsylvanian period. So Carboniferous, right. For those of us who uh, are uncool and use the, the lumping of the Pennsylvania, the Mississippian. So this is a, a formation that is interspersed of shale and limestone. And what that interspersing is telling us is that at each interval, Fresh water has to inundate this this formation in order to leach from from the, from the uh, exposed limestone, right, to create this porous material. That's and right. Basically, yeah. what would happen is it would be exposed. Sea level would drop. It would be exposed, and then the fresh water would do that, and then it would be covered up again. Shale would cover it up, and then the shale after the shale covers it up, then the reefs would begin to pick up again on these little relatively positive features and it would grow again, and then it would reach higher and higher. Okay, and this is occurring at a time period that is, again, smack dab in the middle of the flood, regardless of whether you're using the Snelling or the ICR model, and you're you're basically having to have freshwater inundation, periods of shale accumulation, and also reef growth at precise intervals that just so happen to match the conventional geology of the area that's showing how this freshwater inundates, but it's actually happening all the way underwater, right? <laughs> During that's right. The water. Okay, that's yeah, right. That, that is, that is, wow, that's superb. That's going to be very difficult. I've, and has and again, you, has you, know, you got thousands of wells in this area because there's so much oil there and lots of long cores and studies. It's been studied in tremendous amount of detail. When you, when you have that kind of resource, people have studied it and worked it in a lot of detail. So it's really well constrained. Have you seen the, is has there been a young earth creationist kind of response to this particular formation? What do, what do they make of it? How do they try to explain it? The only things that I could see that they, 
they would say is that this had to be transported. In other words, this really was deposited by moving water. Okay. Now that, you know, you just can't put that in the rock. And, and, and again, even if you did deposit by moving water, you would still have to expose it for periods of time in order to create the porosity and then That's bury it again. And That's going to be tough, given the the entire. If the flood is indeed global, it's what several cubits above the tallest mountain. You're gonna does it does it selectively dry out in patches in the middle in order to create some kind of formation? That's that is very difficult to cope with. I've not heard of this one before. That's yeah. I think that's, that, cool. that's a that's a that's a uh, compatibility problem, or too many yeah. events and too little time. Either way you look at it, that way. Right. They just it just doesn't. I don't see a way to make that work. Yeah, so that's, that's tough. tough. So now that we're going to move up a little bit, a little bit shallower. We're going to look at some Cretaceous reefs. Now the reefs are not still not corals so much. Now there were we did have coral reefs in the Cretaceous period, but the main reef forming is organism is these things called rudis. They're kind of like a clam that's on steroids and stuff. They're oh really, wow! They get really huge. Big. These were cool stuff. I found a lot of these in my thesis area down in Mexico that were kind of growing in place in different types and stuff. But the big reefs so are cool. like this. The reefs yeah, that, the, that'd, be a, that'd be sweet at an oyster house, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm sure it was. A porterhouse to share. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't, uh, yeah, you, you could spread that a long ways that way. Oh, yeah. One for the table. <laughs> Now this trend here, this is about the same size as the um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia today, at least the same length. But again, it but it I'm just showing the part of it that's in Texas. It actually wrapped around a lot of the Gulf of Mexico, so you had it in, in same type of things in Florida. You had them in the Yucatan, all at the same time period that way. Again, some big oil fields, some big water. Some of it has been drowned and, you know, in Texas, sometimes fresh water is more valuable than oil, really, that way. So it comes out of this area. It's a big old reef, then. So it's a long trend. There's a lot of different, a lot of these type of trends. So we've kind of moved up in there. So it's getting harder and harder to find a place to put that flood, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there are, there's a little bit more that, that, that takes place. Texas isn't the place to find the Cenozoic type of reefs and stuff, but there is one that forms on the top of a salt dome, a little coral reef. It forms in the, the kind of the Oligocene epoch. We're up in the Cenozoic time period there. But again, it's it's uh, less than 100 feet thick, but you would have to say that, that at normal rates that reefs grow, that would have taken 150 to 600 years to deposit it. They don't have that type of time frame. No, I don't think you do. Yeah, I think that's going to be okay. Okay, I, I've, I really just, I got to stop you because I love the way that you've presented this. As we're kind of tiptoeing our way of reefs, as you've titled it, reefs through the geologic column through time, and how each reef narrows down that time period that you can slip the flood in there, um, in order to to allow natural geologic processes, although natural geologic processes on steroids, like just moving at hyperspeed to happen, because none of this stuff can happen during a, a highly turbid, just very aggressive worldwide flood that is supposed to be so aggressive that, you know, it's carving out large canyons. And I don't know if you've seen this, but I had the pleasure at the Creation Museum uh, to see their explanation of plate tectonics and how actually we started with Rodinia and then Rodinia splits apart under the waters of the flood, reforms into Pangaea, and then still underneath the waters of the flood, splits again into the modern continents that we see today. They skip all the other supercontinents, it doesn't matter. But I've, I've said to you know people before, like this is, this is race car speeds, continental drift. So like the, these continents are creating wakes as the water is, is you know, falling. They're, and they're supposed just, to be moving at meters per second. Yeah, you yeah. Just and think about a all, continent moving at meters per second. And this is all while uh, these specific geologic processes are occurring, are occurring at different sections on the continent, according to them, under all of the water, some of which can only be formed in calm, warm, 
low acidity or even high acidity conditions uh, that are relatively unclouded. It, that's just that's just wild to me. It is a problem. It is. I don't see. It. I don't see how you get around that. Type of yeah, <laughs> I'll see. I'll see. <laughs> We're going to go up one more step. Now, there are some recent active reefs growing out in the in the Gulf Coast here, but I'm going to go to, to a different part of the world. Again, it's part where I'm familiar with from having worked for Mobile Oil Company. The Mobile Oil Company had this field called the Arun Field, and it's got a 1,000 feet of coral reef. And you can compare that to kind of at the same scale as the Great Barrier Reef, which is much longer, but still... It's a, a 400 foot th thick reef. Um, I know that uh, they want to say that you could act quick. Come in Morris, try to say that you could grow, possibly grow the Great Barrier Reef after the flood. But uh, I think that's pretty hard to believe. But even if you could, you would still have to form, you've had the same type of things which are forming and then buried again. So you've got a much thicker reef that's now buried under thousands of feet of sediment in here and it, again depending on whose model you're dealing with this is either taking place in kind of a post flood or a uh, during the flood type of interval snelling would have this to be taking place all after after the flood all within a, that three or four hundred years that you have after the flood to to work with there. The world's fastest growing reefs that we have never seen, you know, <laughs> corals grow at that pace. But these ones were just built different. They were just really, really good at growing. <laughs> I'm sure that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, gotta yeah. be right. Yeah, you, you can we can go with that. The other but if you want to do it like uh, Clary would say, this would be taking place during the flood. So that's a, that's maybe <laughs> that's even a bigger hard. problem. That is not better. No. <laughs> so you have uh, these guys are, are good at picking out the the problems in, with the others models and they're both right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They're peer reviewing each other to young earth creationism spectrum and as, as a whole. <laughs> so, you know, just to look at the overall overall places again, you know, this was the display that I showed before. Again, these red areas were where I documented reefs. If you wanted to, if you went to other parts of the world, you could certainly document some beautiful reefs in any of the other periods that way. But basically, I'd say off of these is these are places where you can't you can't put a flood. Right. Yeah. So that, that's that's a problem for that. Super. But the other problem that I would point out in this area, coming back to that cross section, is the fact that. Uh, the area back behind the reef in here, like particularly where it's circled here, this actually goes through kind of a field where I did a, a uh, study for a year long where I described a lot of core that took place out of this. And the rock there was actually formed under very, very arid environments, very much like what you get in the Persian Gulf today. So again, the picture on the right is from, from the modern Persian Gulf. And the other pictures are core examples of things that were that are taken from this area. So for instance, on the far left, what we have is algal stromatolites again, and they were exposed to uh, fresh water and the fresh water dissolved holes in them. And then those were filled up with dolomite. And you can see a storm came through, ripped up a big clast out of that. And then there was some more, and then anhydrite grew in the, in the soft muds that were forming there. Again, this, this type of thing is taking place in deep in, uh, dry arid environments the uh, middle picture there is what we call spiderweb anhydrite this is an anhydrite that forms in these type of areas it gives a kind of as it displaces the sediment there's some residue that forms rims in it the bottom right picture has these what were originally gypsum crystals and again they form in those type of arid environments where do we so find them today well we go to the <laughs> Persian Gulf. Yeah. Major salt flats. You've got all of these anhydrite beds and all of the same features that we see in these ancient things. So, again, that, this is my square peg type thing that I'm trying to put in the round hole. How do you do that in the middle of a flood, have very thick deposits that form in an arid environment? 
yeah, thick deposits that, you know, for, for those of you who, who may be out in the audience or are tuning in and in and in and out, this is this is like necessarily formed in, in a what is effectively a desert, right? Um high mm -hmm. aridity and it's got all the diagnostic characteristics of deserts that we see today. So using Mr. Ken Ham's classic observational science only, uh, we're observing effectively a, a desert in the middle of, of a flood, uh, which is going to That's be right. a bit you know, difficult. Bit, just a touch hard to explain. Yeah, I mean, you could take, and, and there's other there's other examples in other areas of these type of things where you get to find the great sand dunes deposits and this type of thing. But uh, to me, these are as, as classic or worse for my or a bigger challenge for them to explain because there's just so much going on that way and it's just yeah. not uh, not happening during a flood oh. but we're getting there so just to kind of sum up the flood deposits that way again we you know we said they identify these things as being flood deposits they make a prediction for what would be there but from our standpoint there's just too many events too little time we saw sediments that's been buried and then turned into rock. Now then we're going to fold that solid rock into mountains. And then we're going to erode those mountains away and then bury them. And then after they've been eroded away, then we're going to grow all these reefs on top of them. <laughs> that's the challenge. That, well, when you put it that way, maybe maybe it's a touch inconceivable. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's, 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 you know, why do you, how do you form air deposits in the flat? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh boy. That's going to be, yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, perhaps what, what we'll get out of this one. Um, there's a, uh, I've gotten some interesting responses to some of these presentations in the past from young earth creationist YouTubers who, uh, who take it upon themselves to solve the problem. So I'm interested to see how we solve this one. <laughs> As you've laid it out here, it seems they've got their work cut out for them. I think there's some big challenges. I think this is a this is a this is a tough area, and this is this is the type of thing. So, what I was seeing back when I was learning geology in New Mexico, and learning seeing some of this stuff, and I'm saying, well, I just can't. Their explanations just didn't work. Right. We're not reasonable. Let me show you just a few more slides. I promise it's just a few. No, I'm loving this. I'm having a great time. I want to take a look at the post-flood deposits, and again, I'm going to look at that area. And you, that red line in there, A, a to A prime, is a, a long cross section that I put together from a number of different sources on that. And it's about 2,000 miles long, and it kind of comes through the area. So just showing what it looks like. So we got it comes across the Permian Basin and the mainly Paleozoic rocks that are deposited in it. Comes up to an area called the uh, Llano Uplift, which is in the middle of Texas. It's a uh, and it's an uplifted area on that, but I've drew it a, a little bit around that. So because we do see the uh, Cretaceous rocks, which are in green, which come over that and come really over the top of the entire Permian Basin there. So then we get into Mesozoic rocks and we come into the Gulf Coast area and we see Mesozoic and Cenozoic rocks in there. And then there's a massive chunk of weird salt that moves and does all kinds of odd things offshore comes up to a line where kind of under the Gulf of Mexico where there's a steep slope where the salt kind of comes up to the, right up to the uh, bottom of the ocean there called the Sig Sigsby Escarpment. So we're gonna take a look, make some observations along this line here and see if we see how that, what that tells us. Okay, first of all, we're gonna look at what, what the prediction is. Again, if we're using the ICR model on that, we're saying that uh, part of that rock took place in 450 years. And then um, if we use the, that 450 years from the other model, it has to be all of the Cenozoic. Oh my God, that. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay, so what we're saying is using the AIG model is that there's all these some rocks were created old and, and then there's a, a lot of flood deposits we've already looked at some of the issues with that and then we have to deposit all of this rock in 450 years which is the in the post-flood time now that's a, that's an interesting challenge 
to try to do that. Yeah, I can see how it might be. <laughs> ICR model looks, maybe looks a little different, looks a little more reasonable, you would say. At least it's not the whole Cenozoic. It's not the whole Cenozoic that way, but they're, well, it's kind of one of these things where you're kind of robbing Peter to play Paul because uh, whatever problems you're solving on the post flood by making that air interval smaller just makes the flood model even harder yep. to buy. Yep. It's, you know, there's just no, no simple way to do that. If you looked at the Gulf Coast and uh, look at another line on that, we see where the uh, there's a series of these ancient large delta systems that formed. They, they formed first with the kind of the green ones up to the coast by the coastline that way, and then they got younger and younger as they got up, got to the south of that. And again, so the AIG would say that the top of the flood deposits goes all the way back to the to the coastline by the green stuff. So the Cretaceous stuff would be flood deposits. The ICR would would move it out basemward of that, but it's still got some, several deltas that's formed out of that. So there's a cross section here at the base, which kind of shows what it actually looks like in that area there. That does all kinds of deformation on these rocks. Which were buried, they were folded, and they were they were hardened again and then folded that way. So we're going to look now at where the flood models put this on this on this cross section by looking see i dropped a little red square down now that little red square we're going to zoom in on that to see what to calibrate things a little bit so this is that the little red square comes up and it's zoomed up and you can see there's a little red package right up at the top of that and that's the deposition that has taken place over the last four thousand years oh my gosh Roughly since the time of Abraham. Okay. It's the zoom that you zoom, you know, enhance. And then I'm like, oh man, it's going to be tough to get that whole red box. And then you're like inside this red box, the smallest sliver at the tippiest top point takes 4,000 years. That's right. That's so, dicey. you know, that particularly for the um, AIG model, for the Snelling model, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's really tough to believe that all of these yellows and oranges in the bottom line in here took place in 450 years, where 4,000 years has only been able to deposit that little sliver. And that's, that's me. And you can, that when I made the point earlier about, you don't need to be real precise. I mean, if you want to double that thickness, you want to triple that thickness, you know, sure. <laughs> no <Go> problem. <laughs> oh man. It really, it really doesn't change a lot from whenever you do that that way. So, you know, again, you know, to me, that, that is an issue that they continue to have that way. If you look at just total sediment thicknesses that the different models have tried to put together, and I said, okay, well, how, how am I going to explain it? If I took the thickest of all of these periods, remembering that both Tim Clary and Andrew Snelling would say that uh, the rock order is correct, so that they're in things are taking place this way. This would be taking the thickest rock from any one location, the thickest place, uh, thickest sediment that way. I mean, if you took one place right now, that'd probably be up in. You could have up to forty thousand feet of section, but if you took it took the thickest part over the whole area that way, then you'd be looking at, you had to deposit almost 200,000 feet of sediment in that 15, in the flood and in the post flood time. And so this allows us to even think about some rates of deposition that you had to have for these to work. Oh, that no. helps you to understand the processes that had to be going on in order to do that. Let's see. You know, in the, uh, you had to basically average 200 feet a year. Looks like I've got one number wrong on the, one of the blue boxes is, is wrong that way. But I had to average 200 feet of deposition per day or 60 meters of deposition per day. Oh my gosh. And during the flood. But post flood from, an, from the, Answers in Genesis model, you have to do, uh, you know, 560 feet per year. And that's just pretty amazing. 
Yeah, you would think you would think at least a couple of people living around that time would have perhaps noticed the wild deposition rates and just general geologic processes going on around them. What life? What would would life have been like with yeah. happening that way? I mean, it that's the real question. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. I think the calibration, the 4,000 year, the rates, the average rates that you had in the, uh, the fastest rates you have in that, in that area, you know, like half a foot a year. Yeah, that's, I, you, you can't function agriculturally speaking when sediment is wiping out your crop, you know, a, a month in. No, no, you can't do this, these type of things. So, well, that begins to, what that begins to say is that, okay, these rates had to be enormous, but in particularly for that interval, post-flood interval, you know, there's no one says there's any biblical reason to say there's, there were lots of miracles going on there, right? This should be yeah. normal processes right. at that point. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to move all of that rock very, very quickly, particularly like in the AIG model or, or the other model for that matter, what you have to have, regardless of what you're doing, is you, you have to have some big rivers, right? Oh, yeah. You would have to have massive big rivers. Well, of course, the problem is now we know what those rivers look like. You know, this is a, this is a map of some ancient rivers that were, were forming in the tertiary time and stuff, and they look a lot like the size of rivers that we have today. You know, Texas likes to think everything is big in Texas, but really those river systems weren't that big, <laughs> even back in those days. And, uh, and they grew over and over again and stuff. We, we see the method. We've mapped out these type of river systems from the uh, base of the, uh, the Cenozoic period all the way through the Miocene period. And this time that it flips and plops back and forth, but they're always pretty small rivers that way. Right. Yeah, no, no, no mega rivers that would be doing that deposition, the necessary deposition. Yeah, that's, I'd not even considered that. But yeah, you, because what else, what other mechanism would be acting to deposit them, to deposit these post-flood sediments? And if it's a river, as you said, it's got to be a pretty flipping big river. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they make the, make the claim that, okay, this is, this was very soft sediment. And so therefore it could be eroded easily, but you still would have to have massive big rivers to do that. Yeah, and, and they just not aren't there. In fact, nowadays I'll show you one, one more image on that. You can actually on some of the three D seismic and stuff, you can see these little river systems, and you can see like some of these have these little meandering river systems, and they're pretty wimpy things. And and the problem on a lot of this is that so much isn't available in the public domain and stuff. Right, but, right. In, yeah. the, in industry, you see these things all the time, and these amazing river systems out in that but uh, they're pretty cool so, so within, within your industry as a petroleum geologist was it very common to encounter young earth creationists within your field of work uh, in the as working as a geologist yes no nah, no no not very much i have known i think three people who were i would say geoscientists right that were, that were young earth creationists two of those were geophysicists and so they and they were finding that they they could process seismic they could uh they could map features as bumps and stuff that way and you can do that without you know relying on a whole lot about how they fit how they form and this type of thing right i have one friend that was a uh, a paleontologist and he was amazing to me that he could uh, he would basically his supervisors knew what he felt that way and he would tell you tell the uh, clients that were reporting to him to have work and stuff that things were so many million years old, but everybody who knew him well knew that he didn't really believe that. But, uh, right. That's, that's, that's very unique. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. That, I feel that that's sort of what Andrew Snelling has done because in his conventional work, he works quite conventionally, right? He uses standard deep time models and things like that, at least from back when he was younger and writing his, I'm assuming, dissertation. Um, but now, not so much. Yeah, and I know that there, there are some that may have developed that, and I don't know what his particular history is. I might, things that I've read su suggested that he never worked in industry, for 
it. So yeah, no, I don't think he worked in it. I think it was just his dissertation uh, as a student before graduating. I don't think he worked in industry. Yeah, and and I know, like, for instance, there's another geologist, uh, Stephen Austin, who I, I've read about yeah. his, his work and what he did and would say that he was, was demonstrating that a particular coal was deposited by moving water. And I don't mm -hmm. doubt that that's possible. I don't have any reason to doubt that a, that some coals might have been deposited that way. But uh, yeah, I, don't think that's, I think that's the exception, not the norm and stuff. But, but he knew at that point where he was. But he, he for instance, he wrote a, a paper on the Capitan Reef that we talked about earlier. But he wrote it under a pseudonym because he was afraid that his name would, uh, he would suffer in his, mm -hmm. his work. He was doing it kind of, I, I think it was between grad, graduate schools or something before going back for a PhD or something like that. But, uh, so, anyway. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you continue. I've, I've got a question, but I'll wait till we're, till we're asking questions for that. Okay, well, I just had one more slide I was gonna show. Again, it's just, uh, just to say, that, well, two slides, okay. You know, there's a lot of other things, even in this area that I've talked about here that we could talk about. We could talk about tidal deposits. We could talk about subaerial volcanism and swamp deposits and the shale units, paleocarps, footprints, paleos, all kinds of things we've talked about. How do you even get arrowheads that were available for Abraham to use? And stuff? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, the stone tools thing is very interesting, especially in, in places like uh, Africa, the continent. Turns out there's a lot of stone tools to be making uh, from Babel to present. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of cool things that way, and it just becomes a um, too many events in too little time for for a lot of these things. You know, again, from my standpoint, this is not a conflict with the science that I have and the and my faith at all. They they fit together fine, and I think it does help when we think about life as having existed on this planet for millions and millions of years. It just emphasizes the things that are uh, pointed out in the book of Psalms. It says, hey, you know, show me my days, my life's in, and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You've made my hands as a mere hand, hand breath. The span of my years is nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. You know, we have a short, short time to live here in this in the life that we have now. And I, and I think understanding the um, history of, of the earth kind of helps to put that in perspective a, a little bit better. Well, and, and, and how wonderful that we live in a time where we can look back at the history of the earth and with wonder and, and ask questions about it and, and discover more about this world that came before us. Um, I, I find that to be just exhilarating. No, I think, I think there's a lot of, it's an exciting time to, to live in stuff that way. I think that it's interesting that we are in a, we have the ability to study that. that, that Truly. Okay, yeah. I'm going to stop your screen share here. And if you are willing, uh, that was an absolute blast to listen to. I had a, a ball listening to that presentation. I learned quite a bit. Um, and as I've said before on sort of the geology presentations here on the channel, I usually like to go listen to them at least one more time, given geology is not my background. But I, I thought that was incredibly concise and very well explained. So we really actually don't have that many questions. I, I think that's a, a, a good thing, actually. Um, but I'll, I'll be selfish and ask a, a question sort of first, um, because I've, I've been dying to ask the, this particular question to someone who is uh, who's worked in petroleum. Um, do you find that radiometric dating as a process, sort of in conjunction with these sedimentary rates, is a useful tool when it comes to finding things like oil and gas and coal? Okay. Uh, you know, we, we use radiometric dating occasionally. Mm. For the most part, as you know, a lot of times we're worried about, about that relative order that rocks are deposited in. We're not really worried oftentimes about how many million years ago it was formed. Right. But now there are a few cases where we do want to know that. It depends a little bit on what you're doing. If I'm if I'm drilling in a, an oil field where I right. really know there's oil, then I don't need to know a whole lot that way. But I do want to know about the processes that deposited it, and I need to understand that. Now, right. when I start talking about um, in a, a more frontier type of area, then I definitely need to know how old how old things are. I need to put that history together. Right. When I want to know, um, for instance, 
a couple of cases where we do. I, let's say I'm in an area and I figure out what I think is going to be my source rock. It's going to have oil that's going to be generated in that in this bed of rock. Well, now I've got to decide if it's possible that it's actually generated oil and gas. Mm. So now I'm going to figure out that burial history is going to be very important to me. So I'm going to try to model that burial history and the actual ages become a piece of it, a piece so, of the plaque. So basin modeling then? Basin modeling is important that way. You know, you can generate, I've had young earth creationists tell me that, okay, you, yeah, you can generate oil from source rock in just a few days and stuff that way. That's not a problem. And, and it's, that's very true. You can overheat it. It's, it's, it gets to be a little bit like whenever you can bake a cake in half the time that you uh, did before if you set the temperature higher. But rocks actually come with this stuff called vitronite in them. Right. And vitronite allows you to know how hot it's been set, been up to. So you know that it hasn't been set at that high temperature. So you can't have generated it quite that fast and stuff. Right. So, so overall, it's primarily going to be useful when it comes to investigating, as you said, frontier areas. So new locations where you're, you're not 100% positive of like providence and things like that. That's the main areas that you're doing it. Now, you might do it in some areas because you've got the, let's say I've been drilling in part of the basin. Part of the basin has a little different history. So I want to, I'm extending this play into that new area that I've got to do that. Okay. I'm going deeper than I'm going to know something because sometimes what happens is you want to know is the rock still porous or has it been has diagenesis the process that might seal up the pores in the rock gone so far that it's uh, it's become a um, factor that you want to do that you that it may have filled up all the frosting and that's something that you will do again with a basin modeling type thing because the time of exposure to that process is a part of part of what kills it. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, this question comes from PhD Tony, who asks you, if you have an opinion on the speed and scale of mineral formation, can this speed and scale of mineral formation be consistent with a young earth creationist hypothesis? Okay. Well, I think there are special circumstances where things can move fairly quickly, right? I think that we, we find that we're going out of the uh, sedimentary type of environment. Let's say we're going into igneous environments and they have these fluids which come off of an igneous body that will form things called pegmatites and they probably form relatively quickly that way in a lot of cases things take place very very slowly i mentioned um, diagenesis the idea that uh, you know for instance sands are deposited as loose sands they get buried and compacted that helps to make them a rock but they also have chemical changes that take place and, right. and the process of filling a quartz of a coarse growth, growth taking in, filling in a pore hole actually takes a long, long time to take. Right. It can take hundreds of thousands of years to fill up, effectively fill things up. So normally it takes slow. Right. So it depends on the mineral. Uh, there's some that can form quickly and some necessarily take a long period of time. Would that be fair? That's fair. Okay. Awesome. PhD Tony had a second section of his question where he wanted to ask you, um, if, to your understanding, if geochronology is reliable and accurate in determining where specifically mineral deposits can be found. I'm sorry, one more time. What? Yeah, sure. Can geochronology uh, be considered reliable and accurate in determining where mineral deposits can be found? So what we know about the geologic column and finding certain minerals like, I guess, precious metals, things of the, that nature. I mean, you know, mineral formation takes place a little bit, is a little bit different. What it is is mineralizing fluids oftentimes, which are coming off of igneous bodies. And so they're coming off of that. And that is typically the geochronology is not as, not as important on that. I mean, we try to time, we try to put together the history of an area, the tectonic history and the area, the timing in which fluids move. Maybe you can help tell, uh, you know, when might, uh, particular veins have been open to form right. and stuff and you try to fit form the history that way but it's not a detailed uh, type of chronology you don't need to have the millions of years to do that we, you work out the order of events called the paragenesis you try to figure out what thing what order the mineral events mineralizing events took place and be as predictive as you can on that but uh, it's probably not a millions of years type of issue okay cool 
All right, the next question comes from Constellation Pegasus, who wants to ask you if there's any evidence for Noah's flood geologically in your opinion. I don't know that I can point to any deposit that was formed by Noah's flood, particularly like that. a worldwide global yeah. flood. Now, yeah. a global flood, I think that's to me that's out. In other words, right. there's no time that a global flood took place. Now, a lo more local event, I think is very, I think that's that that was real and that it took place, but I don't know exactly when that took place and stuff that way. I might suggest that that might be fifty thousand years ago, depending on when you want to date some of the. Uh, biblical events and stuff taking place that way so that would be and i don't know what that far i'd have to be interesting to try to look at some of the history in the persian gulf for instance to, yeah to, yeah to I've, I've, I've actually heard i've heard of some of the rumblings about these these sort of kind of mega lake bursts that may have occurred sort of in the in the ancient near east but on a much more ancient time scale but cultural memory is a thing mm. okay yeah, i want oh sorry go ahead and there might be some help to that memory, too. Yeah. Colorado Biker is our last question that I'm going to read just because I don't want to keep you here too long. It's almost been an hour and a half. So I'll, I'll make Colorado Biker the last here. And um, and if you guys have any more questions, then you can leave in the comments. And maybe Steve will go through the comments later if he has the time or if he feels comfortable, you can shoot him an email. Um, but the last question is, and actually, they're asking if you've heard of the hydroplate theory from Walt Brown for Noah's Flood. And what you think of it? You know, I don't think it's, uh, to me, it's not very different in a lot of ways. It has suffers from the same type of problems that you get with the uh, cataclysmic uh, type of flood model and stuff that's been put out by Baumgartner and these guys and stuff. It ha it's, uh, again, there's just no way that it. That yeah. It, 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 Under. I, I'm sure you've probably heard these numbers before, but under Walt Brown's own numbers, uh, the, the amount of energy that would be required to do things like launch launch Earth rock into space to make up all of the com or all of the comets and asteroids that we have, his number is is pretty bonkers. It, it effectively equates to what what was that? It was like five thousand trillion one megaton H bombs. It's like pretty energy costly <laughs> to get all that all that ejecta to, to create the, the asteroid belt and. And then also to move all the continents and to speed up radioactive decay and to do all of wow. it's not a good situation. <laughs> yeah, it gets it gets pretty interesting to do that. I love the uh, the point that was made one on one of the uh, groups I'm in that talked about the uh, plate tectonics or the cataclysmic type uh, type of thing. It says, one regardless of how you get the plates moving, if you get them moving at a, you know meters per second. Whenever you start trying to slow them down, just like whenever you're driving down a steep, steep hill, then you start applying the brake, you generate oh, heat. Yeah. And so whenever they're moving that fast and then you try to slow them down, it generates, it would generate so much heat that you would basically melt the plates. So. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of the friction issue with CPT. It's, I think the equivalent uh, heat as admitted by Answers in Genesis, they, they actually released a series of papers on like, what are our, you know, what are our thermal issues with this? Uh, and it, it was something along the lines of vaporizing the granite crust of the earth two dozen times over. And then their their answer to that was, well, we're, we're gonna fix the problem, we're working on it. So at least they're working on it. <laughs> well, Steve, thank you so much for being here. Um, is there anything you'd like to say before we kind of sign off here? I thought you might be pleased to know we had over 200 people watching for quite a bit of the stream and around 180, 190 for the rest. Uh, so people were really interested. The comments were incredibly positive. Um, and people thought that your your presentation was just incredibly clear and concise and very well put together, as did I. Well, I, I appreciate that. I did point, I might point out, I guess, that, uh, yeah, I do have a website. If anyone wants to wants to look at I have a lot of, a large Age of the Earth type of section on it, but a lot of other things, because as a Christian, I'm interested in uh, other aspects as well. So it's called uh, Jesus in History and Science. And uh, yeah. they're welcome it's in the description. to find that. And uh, yep, I stuck that into this in the description so that any and everybody who wants to look more into you or shoot you an email because I know your email is on your website, um, that they can go ahead and do that. Um, thank you so much again, and I am going to end the stream. Thanks for being here, everybody. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you.